Well, good morning to you, or good afternoon. It's morning for me. Glad you found us. I am Pastor Dan, and we're here with God Talk. And we're choosing now to go through the book of Revelation. I am, <laughs> by the time you watch this, I'm probably in India preaching. Uh, I've got to tape these things before we go. But uh, so pray for us as we're preaching in uh, different, two different college towns we have in uh, north and in the south of India. But we're doing a book of Revelation, uh, kind of highlights. I used to do a TV show here on LOBN called uh, GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, right here with uh, John Pauline and Philip and Viana and Shifra, Pastor Sarah before. But anyway, they are carrying on. Please find that show when you can. But uh, let's just take some highlights of the book of Revelation and wrestle with them from the character of God point of view. Anyway, I'll start with this. I, uh, we have two sons. One, the oldest one is uh, 28, and uh, we'll be coming home here in a few days. He's been teaching over in Arizona at our academy there in Thunderbird and Scottsdale. But back when he was little, I was ready to give up. You know, you think this is going to be good. We were, we were good students in school, but clearly he wasn't very bright. After a year, couldn't talk, couldn't say a single word, couldn't read, couldn't do anything. Uh, not spiritual. When we would pray, he didn't close his eyes. We would go to Sabbath school, and he would go up, and rather than uh, put the right thing up on the flannel board, he would take the church, Jesus and throw it on the floor. Our little boy, pastor's kid. <laughs> when they would say, uh, go put this thing up on Jesus, he would go put it up on the donkey. He said, no, the donkey is not Jesus. Is there any hope? We would uh, kiss him, I'm sure, 10,000 times. Never got a kiss back. We would have him kind of set him up and kind of start put our arms out for him to walk to us, and he would walk backwards away. That doesn't feel good. Evil. He would uh, wreck things. <laughs> Somehow pulled the whole shower faucet off in the tub, just pulled it off, $60. How did he do that? Just evil, evil little boy. We figured out the time the food and doctors and all the other stuff, probably $600 a month we're paying. It's just not worth it. Now turn them in. Maybe we can do better next time around. No, we didn't turn them in. An amazing young man today. But a lot of people want to give up on the church like that. Church is supposed to be the great place of God where people worship and are love and the Supposed to be a powerful force to rep represent God around the world. And it's not that. Or too often it's not that. And people want to give up on the church or have a funeral for the church. Why doesn't God just give up? That didn't work. <laughs> Let's have another flood and just wipe that episode away. Maybe we can start over again somewhere. Too bad. A friend of mine, I was with this young man just the other day. He's not young anymore. But when he was young, he went to a church not far from us. And uh, growing up in that church, Friday night, he took his girlfriend there, who's now a high-level pastor. And, uh, but he didn't have a tie on, and someone caught him and said, Young man, you, don't you come here again without a tie on? And sure enough, that young man has not gone back to church there. Uh, because of that, 20-whatever years later, church. Churches in Europe have almost died. Go to the cathedrals, there's almost nobody worshiping. One-third in France don't believe in God. Four to six percent ever go to church. Here in America, something like a third, when you say, what is your religion, put none. They call it the rise of the nuns. I mean, they don't believe that there's no religion. I'm spiritual, but not religious, people say. The average age in our particular Adventist church is about 57. The average age in America is about 37. 20 years over the average. What does that mean for the future 
of the church. One pastor told me this week that when he tries to get the high church leaders to wrestle with these issues, they don't want to hear it. Someone has to have a plan. What are we going to do to uh, make the church younger and more live and more relevant? Yes, there's pockets of things are fantastic, but you look at the big numbers, there's some challenges. Some of them don't want to face it. One pastor back east, they had to close their church. It's now a pizza place on a, close to a college campus. It used to be a church. We modeled it into a pizza place. Too bad. And I've said before, some of us were at the, uh, our general conference church session. 20,000 people were there on the Wednesday when everyone wanted to hear what would happen about the whole women's ordination debate. And we had this great controversy. I was sitting among the African delegates who were sad over a speech made by our former general conference president. And they booed all around me, church people booing. It's tough. And then they voted. And they counted the votes. 59% this way, 41%. Our side, our view failed. And my sons were in school, and they're sitting there with their phones dialed in to the website and the streaming, and they're watching. How can our church go that, that path? And my brothers and I were four pastors. We sat at a restaurant getting a milkshake that night just to comfort ourselves. And I got on the phone with my two sons in their 20s. Beg them to not leave the church over this. Church is still good. Church is still of God. It's not going to fall apart because of this. Someday, someday we'll get this thing right. Don't give up. If you give up, then the church will for sure go down a particular path, and that will become who they are. If all of us who care for grace and character of God and equality and love and all these other values, please don't give up on the church. Could it ever happen? Someday we'll have to have a funeral for the church. Like Khrushchev said last week in our message, there will be the final Christian will die and the last Bible will be in a museum in a glass case and people will file by. Oh, yeah, what was that? Well, that was our religion 100 years ago. No. Angelina, Jolie, and Brad Pitt. Everyone thought, what a magical couple. These two super gorgeous movie stars going around the world, adopting kids from other countries and trying to put a family together of this really unusual group of people and their backgrounds. And they thought, wow, wouldn't that be something? Didn't work out. Didn't work out. The dream that they could pull that off did not work out. Is the dream going to work out, the idea that we can come from north and south and east and west from all over the world, and we can be a church, and we can be prevailing, and Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Is it going to work out? Or are the fractions and fissures underneath eventually just going to wear away? And close the doors. Be done. 52% in our country surveyed said religion does more harm than good. It does do harm sometimes. Yes, it does. And now we come to Revelation. And the famous picture, Revelation chapter 1, 12 and 13, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And walking in the midst of them was one like the Son of Man, to use the King James. They stand for the seven churches. And Jesus is still there in the midst of them. Hasn't given up on the church. 
These are not perfect churches. As we go through this, you'll find there were mistakes, mistakes, mistakes. I have this against you. I have this against you. Still there. I've been tempted to leave the church over the time. I was a young pastor 45 years ago. Late 1970s, we had controversies going on in the Adventist church. I had young friends and old friends who decided that they couldn't accept that. Church is never perfect. When do you decide that what they are doing and what they're believing is too much? And you have to have a revolution and a reformation and just blow things up and start over again. Or when do you say, I don't think this is, a, this is worth it. Maybe it's not even true. I had friends that left. I thought about that. And my family's been in the church for over 100 years. And I thought carefully to say, as long as they don't make me leave, as long as they don't force me to sign something, as long as I get a pulpit and I have a chance to preach and be a part of changing the church and making the church in the direction the Bible and Revelation describe it to be, I'm going to stay. And I made it 45 years, and I'm preaching all over the world with the church. I preached last Sabbath to 8,000 people in the AUP University in the Philippines, baptized 100 people that afternoon. Church, with all its strengths and weaknesses, church. Some people would say that the seven churches represent seven eras or church history, and I accept that as one of the two or three acceptable interpretations of the seven churches. First century church, the white church, the church of Ephesus, and then on down the road till we get to the church of Laodicea at the end. But uh, you can also look at it another way that all the seven churches collectively are a composite to help prepare the final church, the seven of seven that are going to be ready for the seals which follow and then the seven trumpets and then the final great controversy decision and people become the final remnant church. So that's another interpretation. I think you can treat both of them, the errors of history, and these seven stand for what God wants a church to be just before the final outcome. The church that will take the final message all over the world with power that had the name of God and the Lamb of God on their foreheads they are going to do the three angels' messages and they're going to be anointed and they will call for that final movement and the shaking time and the sealing and they'll follow the Lamb wherever he goes and there will be a great multitude that will come because of the preaching of the seven church people who are white hot for God. You look at Revelation where it says in 7 verse 9, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, kindred, tongue, and people standing before the throne of God. Because all the angels were standing around the throne. This is the church. And Christ is in the middle again. The angels were standing around the throne and they're worshiping the Lamb. So the Lamb is in the middle. And we're all around at the end of the world. Christ didn't give up on the church. The church didn't give up on Christ. And we are together. There's going to be a church at the end of the world. It is not going to die. It is not going to fade away. Somehow the lights are going to stay on. We're going to keep passing on the torch, passing on the flame. Church is going to make it. And these seven churches at the end are symbols of what that final church is going to be. We sometimes think about the only, the last day church as a Laodicea, this lukewarm church that God is going to spew out of its mouth. No. <laughs> the last day church is going to be all seven of these. It's going to be white hot and all the other characteristics. It's going to be first love. He says, I have this against you. You have lost your first love, Revelation 2, 4. Heartbreaking to God. People come to Jesus. I just baptized a young woman at the beach, I said, no regrets, so happy. At the baptism was a young Vietnamese young man that I baptized a few weeks ago, so happy. 
to watch these hundred people in the pool behind our university outside Manila. I didn't have anything to do with winning these people, but they let me be part of the baptism on ordained pastors. And here they would come down. I happened to be by the little ladder there. And kind of unusual, we probably had seven or eight really old women. And they held on carefully. <laughs> and it took two of us to kind of hold on to them. They held on for dear life. But they wanted to be baptized. Some of them, I don't think, had ever been underwater before. The idea of going under the water, they just would come right back up, and we had to help them. But every one of them eventually got baptized. And to watch them smile, and then Patrick, Dan, can we have a photo with you? So happy. First love. But sometimes they go later. And sometimes we lose our joy. I had a lady in my church, her name was Joy. She just showed up in my my next church here a few weeks ago before I retired. Wonderful couple. They've moved away now. But her name was Joy, and she was Joy, and she would stand up in church and just hallelujah to God. <laughs> and uh, it was you know, a little different, but okay, good for us. And I would have church members come up to me, and Pastor Dan, can't you tell her to be quiet? She's a distraction. She's disrupting our reverence in our church. She was a saint of God, and I said, I'm not stopping her. If God, if God is the one inspiring her to do it, I don't want to be the one stopping it now. She would come and pray for me in the back room and just lift me to God. She did it again here a few months ago. So, first love. The last church is going to be a first love church. Not going to lose their love. They're going to keep their honeymoon. I asked a couple people, can you keep the honeymoon? Can you stay in love? Keep your vows, what brought you together, stay that way with God. The next one, and be faithful unto death from Smyrna, Pergamum, no compromise, Tyra, Tyra, take a stand. Church are going to be a group of people who will not compromise. They're going to stand for God. Nothing can shake them. They will never give up the truth. They have not lost their nerve to talk about Bill Hybels. They have not lost their nerve to speak up when there's time to speak up and say, that's just wrong. That does not represent God. That's not the truth, the way I understand it. It kind of strong. Nobody in the last day church is going to comp compromise and believe crazy ideas about God. They have no lie in their mouths about God. Take a stand. Going to be open doors. They're going to be alive. Sardis says, I have this against you. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're really dead. Some people are looking alive. They're walking through church. They're going through the motion. The Bible says they have the form of godliness but denying the power. They're just playing the game. Cost too much to walk out, betray their family, so they sit. But the fire is gone. They're dead. Someone told me when we were preaching about it one time, Weekend with Bernie, about this guy that had already died, but they couldn't let anybody know that he had died. So they tried to take him around with them. They put him uh, in the ski boat, and he's in the ski boat, and he's with them. He's dead. They look alive. Is that the church? Is that you? One writer wrote, the glory of man is a glory of God is a man fully alive. Supposed to be alive. Jesus said, I came to give you life, life more abundant. Let the dead bury the dead. Supposed to be alive. I beset before you an open door, Philadelphia. There's going to be people in that church that you may not uh, have thought that should be there. There may be straight people and gay people and right-wing people and left-wing people and different colors and men and women and old and young and people that don't dress nice and people that don't smell nice and people that have said things that you thought, well, they shouldn't be around. And maybe there's a few people that don't wear ties in church. And the Bible says there's going to be an open door that no man can shut. And then there's going to be, it says, people that are no more lukewarm. They're going to be white hot for God. Ever been around a white hot person? <laughs> there is nothing like it to be with a group of people that are just white hot for God. I had lunch the other day. I was doing an ordination for a young man, and I had lunch with him. He's so excited, Pastor Dan. I've been one of his, kind of his mentors, and he would come to my church when I was at the university. 
Now he's a full-grown pastor, and he's got this ministry, and he's visiting in the jail, and he's doing seminars, and he's a force. Proud of him. We ordained him. White hot. To be with these young adults in Manila a few weeks ago, trying to do something. I read an article that they wrote here last night. Monday afternoon, this week, I was there in the Philippines. Three days ago, I'm in the Philippines. And here we were, 10 or 12 of us, and the coffee bean uh, little place there, getting little drinks and water, get a cookie and uh, discuss God. And here were people from the Manila Crusade, and here was the ministerial director of the union, ministerial director from the conference, a couple of my church members from over here, secretaries, and here we were, old and young, men and women together talking about how to do something for God. For three hours, no one wanted to leave. Finally, I had to go get on a plane, and some of them got in the car, followed me to the airport. Say goodbye one more time at the airport. Precious people, white hot, white hot for God. Doing great things, starting churches for God in downtown Manila. There was nothing else like it, my friends. And someday we're going to have a church that is seven for seven. This is not going to be in heaven. This is going to be down here. There's going to be a church that have first love and they are faithful and they're going to be no compromise and they're going to be take a stand and the door is open and they are alive and they are white hot. And they give the final message and there will be the final debates. And while evil goes crazy, God is going to have a church that is powerful and anointed and white hot and it's going to be like Acts 2 and Pentecost all over again, the latter reign. I want to be part of that. I came home Monday night and said to Hilda, I said, we are, we are lucky how many white-hot people I get to be around and get to be a part of. And I get off the plane in the southern Mindanao, and here's a group of people just on fire for God. And a group of them get in a van with me, and we go from church to church. <laughs> and here's a little band playing for us, and we go in there, and there's some coconuts and some mangoes. And there's a Sabbath school room that needs to be done, or there's a church that needs to be done. Pastor Dan, can you help us? And we stand there and we pray about it, and they're trying to win people. I got up early Saturday, Monday morning to go to another place. Group of people there. Here's the ministerial secretary from the mission, and here is his father, 70 years old. Had a banner, the church that we built. They call it the New Garden Grove Church. And here was a banner, and here's this older man was now preaching, trying to Fill up this church. White hot. Someday it's going to be like that. Everybody's white hot. You can't give up on the church. Church is where Jesus is. Church is going to be, Jesus is in the middle of a church. You want to be with Jesus, you're going to have to be in the church. And my friends, if you have lost your first love, someone on the line, go, away, go back and get it. I talk to pastors sometimes who have lost their first love. I said, go back. And Revelation says, go back to where you were, where you had it before, and come back and go down a different path. Heard a story by Bill Hybels one time when he was sailing and he got to a place and he realized he was minutes away from the summer camp where he found Jesus from a rich family. All about religion and doing and commandments and rules and laws and church was boring. And he's at a summer camp, 17 years old, and a teenager counsel, counselor says, salvation is not based upon what you do, but what he's, what Jesus has already done. Lit this guy's heart up on fire, Bill Hybels. I'm going to go back there. He found some hippie kid in an old car, had no gas, had to pay for gas. He said, would you take me out to this place? It's not a camp anymore, but he kind of got the lay of the land, and here's where I stood, and here was the little hill. And while the young, hippie, long-haired kid sat there in his jalopy, Bill is out there on the hill. Everything had happened in 40 years, 20,000 members and the Willow Creek Association all over the world, and 50 books and all the rest. And everything had come because of that first love at a camp in Wisconsin, thanks to the young guy at a campfire. He said, God, have I kept my first love? And he just prayed to God to be faithful to that God of his first love. Stay white hot for God. 
Got back in the car, and the young hippie said, uh, what were you doing over there? I said, well, I'm praying. This is where I found God, told him the story. And the kid said, uh, do you think I could do that too? <laughs> yes, you can. God's still in the saving business. And can I be very clear, my friend? There's going to be a day when this Revelation 15 thing is going to happen. And there's going to be a group of people around the throne on the sea of glass, victorious over the beast. And what are they going to be singing? Song of the Lamb. Revelation 7, 10. Salvation belongs to our God. There is grace that helps you become like Christ. There's grace that helps you become victorious. But that is second grace. This is first grace. Salvation grace. Grace that brings you Jesus. Grace that wipes away your sins and say there are no more. I was, uh, I had to have an oral surgery a while ago. While I was in that surgery, who knows what I said. You know, you're alive and awake. But uh, I said to my church, I don't know what I said. I could have sworn. I could have talked about you. I could have talked about the church. Who knows what I said. But I said, I woke up and it's all forgotten. It's gone. And that's the way it is. I said to every one of those people I baptized last Sabbath afternoon, your sins are gone. You're new, Jesus. It's first grace, salvation grace. And the great multitude are going to stand there and sing, salvation belongs to our God. We are saved by Jesus and Jesus alone. That's the church. So if you've lost your first love, go back to your salvation where Jesus wiped away your sins and Jesus paid it all, Jesus did it all. And you found Jesus and you were alive and awake. Then go hold on to that. The challenge is you and I begin to grow. And as we begin to get over sin or begin to get over bad letter words or whatever it is, and we begin to think somehow maybe I have something to do with this now because I am better than these people, better than I was before. But here it says clearly the people that are going to be sealed are going to be singing amazing grace. I uh, want to be very clear here. I absolutely believe in being mature, growing in Jesus, becoming more like God, living victorious lives and keeping the Ten Commandments and doing missions and giving money and getting over that last 10% of things in your life that are not, not ideal and the best. But we will never, never offer God anything that we have done, never offer anything in our resume. We will be standing in that huge crowd singing, Salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. Church is not going to die, it's going to make it in Jesus.